Thank you for inviting me to speak at this. Thank you for selecting multiple myeloma as the disease to uh, discuss. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to talk. So um, I'm going to present part of my story at this session, and then I'll present the rest of it at the uh, various breakout. For me, um, my story for myeloma began in 1995, 17 years ago. Um, actually, the year before was a great year. I was VP of marketing for a company. I helped take it public. I live here in the Silicon Valley. Um, coached my son in Little League baseball. Um, I have two daughters um, who were doing well in school. And then in the beginning of 1995, I started having a backache. And this backache got worse and worse as the weeks went by. I was hunched over. There was no relief from pain, whether I was lying down, sitting up, walking. And I started complaining mostly to my wife, who said, go to the doctor. And so I did. I went to a back specialist, an orthopedic back specialist, who did the MRIs, did the x-rays. They didn't show anything. And he suggested I get three weeks of bed rest. Well, that was a problem. Um, first of all, it continued to be painful lying in bed, and secondly, I was falling further behind in work. And most important, it didn't go away at all. It didn't relieve the pain. So I went back to him. Now we're into uh, March after a couple of months of pain. And I said, that didn't help. What do we do now? He said, well, I'm going to do a test called a myelogram. Apparently a myelogram, that you take a blood test one week and, and then you inject some dye down your back to get a better look at what's going on. And they did that blood test. And then the intervening weekend, my back stopped hurting. My back hasn't hurt in 17 years. And I went to him before that myelogram, which did sound like it was going to hurt. And I said, cancel it. I'm out of here. Send me the bill, although I'm not honestly sure what you did. And he said, wait a minute, the blood test that you took last week showed that you most likely have a cancer called multiple myeloma. Wow, he could have knocked me over. I finally felt good, and this guy tells me I have a cancer of something I've never heard of. And, I, and I'm sure he told me lots of other good stuff, but I'm sure like any patient, when you hear the word cancer, your mind kind of goes off to other areas. But I thought I was smart enough, and I asked them two questions. One, I had them spell out myeloma. I actually had them write it down on the back of a business card um, because I was going to do a little bit of looking up about it. And secondly, since I felt good, I asked them, what single myeloma? Maybe I don't have it as bad as whatever multiple myeloma is. Why are you laugh? But I mean, I thought that was a pretty reasonable question. And he kind of explained that there's... Honestly, no such thing as single myeloma, although you may know that there are, can be a solitary plasmacytoma, but generally it's just referred to as myeloma. So I left his office and went to the adjoining hospital library, looked up some information. You have to remember this was 1995, so there were a few books. The Internet was pretty poor. But the information I found saw that there were a couple of treatment options, there was no cure, and the average lifespan was two to three years. And so this was pretty serious. And I remember going home to my wife and uh, explaining the little bit I understood about this disease. And suffice it to say, we, we shared a good cry. And I was assigned this oncologist who said, well, we're going to start you off with a regimen of chemotherapy called VAD, which stood for vincristine, adriamycin, and dexamethasone. And it requires you uh, to go in the hospital one week a month for this 96-hour uh, infusion. And that's when um, I had to say something to my kids. My girls were 16 and 14. My son was 10. And you don't really know what to say to children. Um, and I'm not even sure what I did say. I remember something like I was going to be treated for eight months. I have a disease of the blood. And my oldest daughter asked if I had cancer. And to this day, when I talk, it's still, it's difficult for me to say the word, and it was really difficult to hear it from her. 
But we tried to keep things as normal as possible. I went into this hospital uh, to begin my VAD treatment. So I've got an IV bag uh, hanging down and uh, giving me this infusion of orange stuff. And I, had, I, I felt good. So it was kind of weird. I had a laptop with me. I was trying to figure out how do I get across uh, through the uh, hospital phone system so I can go out and do email. I had folks from work coming in to have me read through stuff and approve it. I had family, friends visiting me. Um, and so it wasn't so bad. And, I, and then I had one gal that walked in. And I didn't know her. And she said that she was a social worker. And she encouraged me to go to a support group meeting that night in the hospital. And the support group was um, held or coordinated by the what used to be called then the Leukemia Society. Now it's called the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And I honestly didn't want to go to any support group. I didn't feel like I wanted to be any touchy-feely stuff and She said, you know, you should share your story. And hell, I didn't know what my story was. So I told her, I have myeloma. I don't have leukemia. That's the wrong meaning for me. Off you go. And and she explained that the Leukemia Society really covered all blood cancers and encouraged me to go again. And I remember getting out my laptop and I was going to bring up my calendar and explain that I already had a meeting scheduled in the hospital that night and I couldn't make it. And Then it got too difficult to do that, and I ended up going to this meeting. I dragged my IV pole to the second floor and attended this meeting and listened to people who said things like, I have AML, which is acute myelogenous leukemia, but I had no idea what it was. Or I have uh, non-Hodgkin's disease. Didn't know what a Hodgkin's was, so a non-Hodgkin's didn't really matter to me either. And then one individual named Jim said he had multiple myeloma. And that was the first time I got to see someone living and breathing with this disease. And I picked Jim's brain in terms of how do I find out more, and he helped me uh, find a local myeloma support group, and he helped me uh, just get educated. And I watched him because he was still able to work. He was an insurance agent, and worked out of his home, and and continued to do his job. And I was always appreciative of him being there and my meeting him, although unfortunately he died within about three years of my meeting him. I learned also quite quickly that um, my disease was not only going to impact me, but certainly have an impact on my family. Um, I want to read you one thing that my 10-year-old son, Jason, wrote. And he wrote this short verse, and it stayed with me through all my treatment. He wrote, Dear Dad, I can't wait until the eight months are over, so there are no more visits to the hospital for a long time. I can't wait until everything is back to normal, like us two throwing the baseball or football or shooting hoops, like before we knew about this cancer. I just can't wait. Love, Jason. So... First of all, I learned in in my son's eyes I was a three-sport athlete, so that was cool. (laughs) But I also learned that he and the other kids had heard me at the dinner table, and uh, my disease was going to impact them. I, uh, I, when my oncologist that I was assigned, I, I always asked questions of the doctors. And my first oncologist, one of the first questions I asked him was. How many myeloma patients are you seeing? And he said, oh, I'm seeing one other. And that didn't feel good to me. So I went around trying to find other myeloma doctors. And I found one uh, that was part of a team of uh, hematologists and asked him, kind of interviewed him, and how many patients are you seeing? He said, I'm seeing a dozen myeloma patients. Wow, that was an order of magnitude better. I'm switching doctors. And so I did, and, and this particular doctor was also good about encouraging me to get second opinions, um, and so I did that. I went up to Stanford, which is only a half-hour drive from my house, and met with the uh, head of their uh, bone marrow transplant clinic, uh, a guy named Dr. Carl Blume. Um, and at the time, he said, uh, well, we're really good at dealing with leukemia and lymphoma, 
but we've just changed the protocol for handling myeloma patients, and we've tried it with a couple patients already, and it seems okay. So that experience level, all, again, didn't feel so good to me. And as I did a little bit more research, I found out there's this place in Little Rock, University of Arkansas Medical Center, that specializes treating myeloma patients. You have to remember, when I was diagnosed, there were only two treatment arms. One, if you could do a transplant, you, were, you had this induction therapy and then a transplant. And I was relatively young, so that was kind of the arm I would go on. Or the other arm was this combination of oral drugs called melphalan and pregnisone. But I had to find a place that I could do transplants, and Arkansas um, had quite the transplant protocol. In fact, they had a tandem transplant protocol, and they still do. So I made a number of trips out to Little Rock, talked to different doctors there, and felt pretty comfortable about following their protocol other than my having to travel to Little Rock. I, uh, in 96, early 96, I had their tandem transplant. So I spent a number of weeks out there. Uh, one transplant was in, uh, I guess I harvested stem cells uh, in January of 96, had a transplant in February of 96, had a second transplant in May of 96, and I was in a complete remission. So that was really good. And I handled the transplants relatively well. I was able to take a laptop with me and do a little work back there and uh, still go to my office when I returned and, and still work my job. But by the middle of 97, so only 16 or 18 months after that first transplant, my myeloma numbers were no longer uh, showing that I was in a, in a good response. And, and in fact, they were going back up. So I can't con uh, contacted my Arkansas docs and went out there, and they said, well, why don't you try this clinical trial that we're just starting for thalidomide? So I went on the thalidomide trial, and at that time we were taking 800 milligrams a day of thalidomide, which if you're familiar with that drug, uh, if you're on it today, typically the dosage is closer to 100. But that was in a phase one, two, where we were still looking at not only treatment and response, but maximum dosages and such. And so 800 milligrams a day of thalidomide meant that I got a really good night's sleep each day. Um, I also tried to sleep in the morning. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I was refractory from it. I didn't, not only did I not respond, but my numbers got worse while I was on it. So I tried other treatments uh, throughout 98, uh, different chemo regimens, but my health was failing. And I did the only other treatment option available to me then, and this, that in uh, November of 98, I had a full allogeneic transplant at Little Rock. And again, I got into a complete response, um, but uh, there were side effects from that, what I, uh, and I'll talk about those later. The allotransplant for myeloma patients is hardly done anymore. Um, there's about, a, from a full allotransplant, there's about a 40% fatality rate just from the transplant. Um, my uh, sister was my donor. She was a complete match. I always think it's interesting, too. She actually had, she was a complete match, but she had a different blood type than I did. Um, and now I have that different blood type. Um, and I also contact her every so often and blame my monthly boot swings on her, but she doesn't accept responsibility for that. I, um, my Arkansas doctor who did the transplant was also great for me because he contacted uh, one of the myeloma doctors at Stanford, um, and between the two of them, they agreed that Stanford would do my follow-up because I wanted to... I had spent now seven weeks during that transplant process in Little Rock, and... It was just before Christmas, and I really wanted to get home by Christmas, and I, I was able to do that. I, um, as I said, that transplant is really difficult. Uh, it requires you to, to have someone with you at all times. I remember my parents, my wife, one of my sisters, all pulling out a calendar and figuring out these one-week shifts they were going to visit me during my transplant procedure. And my mom came out 
um, just before Thanksgiving. And at this point, I'd had the transplant. Um, I was really doing bad. I was lying in bed. I couldn't get up. I didn't want to get up. Um, I had complications uh, of my heart. Um, but my mom came in that first day and overheard the doctor say, you know, you should try getting up and, and maybe just doing a little walking. Well, my mom heard that, and she considered that her mission. I, uh, I remember that day she made me just walk out to the nurse's station and back. And the next day she made me walk one lap around the hallway. And the next day I had to do two laps. And at that point I asked my mom, when are you leaving and when's the next shift coming in? <laughs> um, and, and I guess fortunately she didn't listen to me and kept making me get out of bed. But I survived it, and, uh, and I'm always thankful for what she did. Still, there were difficulties afterwards, even, even during that. Um, after that transplant, I remember getting back home, and my wife came crying to me one day. And uh, I said, what's the problem? She said, well, the insurance for that company, uh, for that transplant, that third transplant, has been denied and she showed me the quarter of a million dollar bill that I was just sent. And uh, we went through appeals after appeal and finally got it overturned. But that kind of stress when I was trying to recover from a transplant and uh, just general stress was, was uh, awfully difficult. So that's kind of the end of the first part of my story. But I will update you on my kids. Um, I... Uh, I guess in the beginning of 2001, when it looked like I was going to be recovering, I started setting long-range goals. And uh, so I was fortunate enough to get to see my kids graduate from high school and college. Um, my oldest daughter, the one who asked, do you have cancer, is a breast cancer researcher up in Seattle. My middle daughter uh, trains dolphins in Florida. <laughs> and my son, I... Uh, I watched him play some high school ball, and uh, he uh, graduated from UCLA with a music education degree and, and conducts high school orchestras. And so these long-range goals became one of, of being able to watch my son conduct one of his orchestras, and I've done, gotten to do that several times. I, uh, and, and for my daughters, I had always told them that um, I can't wait to walk you down the aisle and bounce a grandkid on my lap in that order. <laughs> and and when the last, within the last five years, I've uh, uh, gotten to walk both daughters down the aisle. And uh, my oldest daughter uh, gave us our first grandchild, who's now nearly three years old, and I've bounced on my lap many times. And just this past Sunday, my other daughter told us uh, she was pregnant and due in November. So we're really excited. Um, I always think I've been very fortunate because the problem with myeloma today is if you're diagnosed, one, you still haven't ever heard of it, and two, you also learn there's no curative treatment. So, um, but what you do learn is that there are many more treatments. That's the good news. There are really many more treatment options for myeloma. Uh, the bad news is there are really many more treatments for myeloma, and you don't know which one's best for you? You do learn that the goal for myeloma um, is to try to manage the disease for as long as possible. When a, when a treatment starts working, you stops working, you hope that there's another treatment down there. I think the, uh, the myeloma patient who expressed it best said that, you know, being a myeloma patient is like being a frog. Um, a frog has a lily pad, and at some point that lily pad begins to sink. Um, so as a myeloma patient, you always need to have in mind where that next lily pad is for you. What's that next treatment going to be? Um, I still go in and check my blood counts every six months. I'm still in a good uh, remission, but I also know what those next one or two lily pads are for me because I expect the doctor sometime to tell me it's back. So with that, I th think I'm going to stop. I know you're going to hear lots more good information about multiple myeloma. I look forward to uh, meeting you during the 
uh, breakouts, and I appreciate your listening. Thank you.